platform? Is that what you guys are doing? You're, you're providing? Yeah, that's, a, that's what the totally kind of allows or Ethereum allows. People will just create a contract, some of it by the GUI for it so it makes sense to people, and they would interact with that contract. Okay. So instead of being a paper thing, paper, paper you know, interaction with a lawyer, they could have, it def they could define it um, in this new GUI with and they would reap the benefits that the, that the smart contract provides. And they know that they actually will be getting those benefits. Okay, I guess there's maybe some questions we need to talk about about that. You have a lawyer in on providing some sort of term or contract, you know, that, that the, the label or a company such as yourself would um, attest to the sort of the licensing of the legality, saying like, oh yeah, this is an encrypted contract, but it's also supported by a law firm. So um, I don't know if it deals with legalness too much. I, I, I think <laughs> a, a contract's a misnomer. It really shouldn't be called a contract. If anything, it should be called like a self-executing, self-executing things based upon conditions. Because a contract's really just a legal and enforceable promise in court. Um, so I, I think it's a marketing issue. Um, these aren't really contracts, these are more like things that will happen under certain conditions. On the blockchain. Yes. yes. Does, Th does thanks anyone, for saying that. Does anyone know what if this then that? I F T T T? Um, Conditional statements? So basically if this then I can kind of say like, oh if I get an email from David, um, make a post on Facebook. You kind of just like write on it, these little boxes, you kind of write right, it. It's like 85 degrees tomorrow, send me an email. Yes, and you, can, yeah, you, can, you can make a bunch, of log, like, a bunch of logic rules and you just walk away. So when this thing happens, everything kind of goes to the system. Yeah, it's self, so that, that's, it's what smart, that's what a smart contract is, except it's in this other kind of construct uh, that's interacting with everyone else. Um, so if someone, if someone does this, then it'll do that. And if it does this and it doesn't have the special condition, it'll fail and won't, won't complete. You know? Yeah, uh, I guess part of the difference, maybe I'm missing the point. Will this stand up in court, though, on some level, if the artist says, hey, I've got a smart contract that says I have the rights to such and such. Well, if, if, if the people who are in litigation agreed at some point, and that agreement will be logged in a transparent ledger, I don't really know what argument you could make against that, right? Because it's it's immutable, yeah, it's unchangeable. I, I, I think it's a little too big. I mean, I don't know. Like, if, you have to kind of, kind of preface it with like a case. Like, uh, <laughs> I, 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 I guess, really don't know how to answer your, your, your question. I think I what I'm hearing is uh, you're thinking of it as you know, real world today contract, a piece of paper that someone worked out with a with a lawyer, and there's a law behind it. Whereas here, it's more of a system contract, which is more of just a transaction. Yeah. So, but there's an interesting question because how do you get from you know what's what's a law to what the system is told to do? So, you know, there's somewhere in between. You, you will have had to identify what those rules the system needs to execute are. Would you like to address address this? John in the back? Did you talk about that? Go ahead. Uh, no, I, I, I'm just stating what I think. Yeah. What I think is. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I, I don't know, I guess, can't hold something standing in court? Like, uh, let's say someone's contesting that I actually wrote this song. That, that means they can look at the blockchain as a source of truth or not. Uh, you could probably get other records that probably like bring like oh the video camera of them in the session. I, I don't know. Like that that's kind of off to the side. Like I that, it's not really kind of what we're dealing with. Okay, Jason, you write a composition. Yes. <coughs> you you write a composition for a particular T V series. Right. right? Um, you want to make a contract with whatever the let's say it's just for I'm doing that right now. So the 21st happens. century films, right? The sure. Composition film. How does this stuff come into play in that kind of scenario? Well, it doesn't now. <laughs> no, but how would it? How would that be? That's what I'm asking. Um, yeah, I mean, we could. I would likely hope that there'd be a platform that would have some sort of template for me to so, like, or develop it myself. You know. So Jason would have said, like, in order to use this this song, this. This particular song, you have to pay $10. People at the studio go like, you know, listen, they're listening to the song, they're sampling, they're like, oh, I really like this one. 
Okay, uh, what are the rules to use this on? Oh, it's 10 ether. Fuck it, okay, 10 ether. That goes to Jason, and now they're allowed to use it. Now, whether or not, like, another TV show uses it without that, and Jason finds out, then he can kind of like complain on, on, you know, outside of the, the, the smart contract ecosystem. Now we're like legal and like in real world things that are not what we're talking about. Practically speaking, I think there would be a real, there would be an actual traditional contract yeah. for the smart contract. I mean, if, if something goes like uh, like wrong on the smart contract, on the blockchain, it doesn't mean that I can't still sue you and we can't still litigate. Yeah, and, and that's a whole like whole other thing, right? That's sitting on the top. I think that's why like contract is, yeah. it's, it's, it's just totally <laughs> blocked, but it, it's a, that's up to understand. As you're talking about, I see. The metaphor of these on the contract, but you're actually talking about just having some sort of uh, just rights over your, your product. That's right. And so, I mean, sure. Your product, whoever. Yeah, yeah, yes, yeah, so you've had your hand raised a couple times. Yeah. Correct me if I'm wrong. I think the nature of the question is how can Jason replicate his current system on a platform like this, right? Yeah. Which is not what you're talking about. There's no situation in which someone can go look for your music, pay 10 anything, and then just use it. Right? There is, Current, huh? I mean, there are plenty of platforms. No, no, Jason's music. Right? His music isn't anywhere right now where someone can just go look at it, pay 10 something. It, it is, and, that's, that's what you and I and all, all these other places where you keep your music. Just, like yeah, there there is a repository where anyone anyone with an account could log in and request to use my music. But through, they need a request. Right. Right. They can't just pay, leave, and go use your music. Sure. They, they actually have to interact with like the label and like do all that other stuff that that's in the middle. And so what you're, I, mean, I think the nature of the question is like that's the way the world is now. How would you replicate that in a system like this? Not how do you. There's, no, there's a whole lot of logic that has to be crossed before someone would go from the world that Jason lives in now to the one that you're describing. And that's the, the question. Like, what's that bridge look like, right? Am I the person who yes. yes. So that's the question to you. It's like, how would you replicate Jason's actual world in this new platform? Well, I would likely have to create new content and put it on a platform like Ujo. I'm not really sure if that would really work. My current catalog is tied up well, at least for the next couple of years, with this specific, uh, specific publishing company. Once I retain rights back to that material, then I can say, okay, well now I control the copyright. So there, now you've got it, but you, want, you still want a system that operates similar to the one that you've got right now. So how would you do that? For something we, we, like, we'd have to imagine companies at that point. Right. And use some sort of thing platform like you put you put music on Ujo. Um, these music uh, producers uh, are, are listening to it and going, are using that platform to, to source the songs that they want to. And, they, and the only way that they could use it is to buy the paying payment ether. So like they would have to go to an exchange, have uh, a wallet, buy some ether, and then make a transaction from their that wallet into uh, well using the smart contract uh, into uh, Jason's wallet. And then they get they they're allowed to use that. Yeah, uh, I think this kind of goes to this gentleman's question earlier about like how do I, you know, hypothetically who go or one of these like choose who who gets access. I think we got to remember that we're talking about like a new technology that can enable a bunch of platforms, but those platforms haven't been built yet. That's right. So just kind of keep that in mind. And so to your question, I think how would this work in the future? Uh, well, we imagine that there are a few platforms uh, out there that can uh, automatically distribute your music for you based on some conditions and then pay you based on those conditions. Then probably what it would look like is you would sit down with Netflix or whoever and you would say, this is the deal we want to work out. And you would say, by the way, I heard that there's these awesome platforms out there where I can get paid automatically instead of waiting for you. Can we put this on there? So you would kind of come up with the, the, the basic uh, deal, and then, and then you would probably have to pay a programmer, or maybe, you know, in the perfect world, these labels would be like hip to this, and they would have staff that can be like, yeah, we're going to, we've got a bunch of templates, we've done this a bunch before, we're going to deploy it on these platforms that we've all agreed meets our needs, and we're going to take 
kind of like how you go from like a term sheet to a contract. Like we're going to take these terms we've decided on, and we're going to implement them on one of these platforms. I think is probably how it works. Yeah, and I think to your point again, there's we don't really know what what we're going to be stepping in next. Um, we're kind of blazing a trail and, 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 and finding out as we go. And I think, yeah, a lot of us just don't have answers to what it's what that transition is going to look like. Um, that's in large part why we have these meetups and you know why we're building out these technologies is to find out if it's if it's possible and who could be successful in doing that. The transition I was referring to is actually a transition in terms. Right. The question, I think, is how do you replicate the current terms of the system, like of the current model, in this platform, right? Where the steps are, someone goes to a catalog, sees a song that they're interested in, makes a request through, the, through BMI or whichever of the other ones that they want to. That request gets logged somewhere, someone reads that request, someone then evaluates the commercial viability of that request, references you, perhaps, if that's part of your deal, mm -hmm. and then you approve or disapprove, and then they go back uh, with the terms that you've all agreed to, and then complete the, the deal, and then deliver the music. Okay, so all of that has to happen. Yeah, the thing of it is, like, all of that happens now with a lot of people, and a lot of time, and a lot of slowness. These new blockchain systems will automate all of that. The right. question, the nature of the question is how? Right. Like, yeah. Okay. So, so, so as a user, as a user, you won't really see any difference. That's the answer. As a user, if you want to purchase his music, you will go to a website like you do now. Yeah. You will listen to it, and when you want it, you will say buy. So as a user, you won't know any difference. But the content providers will have more power than they have before because they get to set the terms of these arrangements rather than you know. A label dictating everything. These smart contracts will enable content providers to say, I'm willing to do this, this, and this. These platforms will arise, make it really easy to use, so you won't know any difference. Behind the scenes, though, everything will be transparent and written to the blockchain, where smart contracts will automatically take care of most of those things, making costs for that, and making the artists you know, more a part of this. The how is the smart contract? That's what, what would, that would be. So, nice. so like, for example, they want to buy it, it, goes, it sends a notification through the blockchain to the respective parties based off some rules. So to go, let's say, the publisher, the label, and what, the artists, right? And it requires two out of three approvals to, to, get, to get onto, to allow you to use it. Uh, they would open their app and go like, oh, I've got a thingy. Do I li like this show? Sure, I approve. You know, and then the other parties are doing the exact same thing, and once, Two out of three is met. Um, you get a notification going, "Oh, your request for Jason's song is approved, and now you, you're, you're you're like protected. Like, oh, I, I bought the song, now I can use it for these terms." Is there a case just, where E3 is actually being used to do transactions, transactions which you can discuss? Not just the music, but any, is there any example that currently exists where E3 e, blockchain? Ethereum is used to uh, manage contracts. Uh, yes, I can think of one, and that's um, so it was a little, depending on the air industry, it's, it's interesting or not. Freights. It was this, it was a silly company. So with freight supply chain management. But, yeah. So uh, I have a bunch of stuff in China. I need to ship it over to uh, Britain. So I have to pay the freight some amount. And they have like agreements on what you know, what store and all those other things. Um, so they, they pay an amount to them, and it goes through, and they have to like pay all these sort of ports, and it's kind of all, all kind of exposed to, to them. Um, and at the very end, once they receive it, there's a whole other set of checks, and then they they, they, they get more money at the end. Like there's like a couple transactions that happen. And what's crazy is that in, in that entire journey, that 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 freight may have been sold to different parties multiple times. Within that journey, so I think I think that's actually a month Yeah, that's I know that's the company that, that did it. So all of that that work of like it reached to this core, uh, that log information where it is, and the the value exchange um, can be done on the block uh, on the blockchain, and they're they're being paid in that way. Because before you know you pay a hundred fifty thousand dollars, and and you wait two weeks, it finally arrived. 
you get these like the log of everything, and like, oh, it's actually this much now. Um, these things sort of happen, and now it's <coughs> again. And then they, the, the respective companies get paid like four days later because it's, these are large sums, right? Um, so it actually does take like four days. Um, and instead of all that, they're just using the, the record logs of uh, the Ethereum blockchain. So and that's a functioning example. Yes. Yeah, so that, they so I, I, like it was kind of marketing. I think they did like one or two shipments. Oh, so I, I, don't, I don't, it's not like used every everywhere in every single ship. Still being monitored, like, like on a case by case basis. But that, that's the one that, that comes to mind that actually is a real world thing that I know uh, is being done. What's yes. I don't recall. That was oh, like okay. eight months ago. So um, back to your creation of uh, music. So let's say you create a song and then you you go and create that contract. How um, how would your ownership that to that music actually be uh, insured because anyone could come in and create a contract and, and say, oh, I created this. Uh, well, there's a, there's a gentleman called Benji Rogers. I mentioned him earlier. Uh, he's advocating for a file format called dot .blockchain um, as opposed to the MP3 or whatever other file format music comes in, right? There's a bunch of them. Yeah, yeah, that's what and inside the file format, you would actually log that information. Um, you would parse out the percentages of the copyright. And that, before you hit bounce or export from your digital audio workstation, um, you would, before the final master gets printed to the CD or uploaded to Spotify, all of that information would live inside that file format as metadata. And there would be something he calls the minimum required data. I believe that's what the acronym is. I might be watching this. You can look it up afterwards if you're interested. Um, where not all the information is required, but that there are, that you at least know who wrote what percentage of the song, um, the country that the song was produced in. And I, I forget, there's a couple other instances or a couple other metadata points that would be actually living inside that file format. And then if you were to ever use that song, there'd be no way for you to manipulate that data once it's living with inside that, uh, that song, the metadata of that song. So if you download a, a track from iTunes, there's nothing stopping you from changing the album artwork or changing the year that the song was produced and so on and so forth. That, that's all mutable data. Um, which is incredibly messy if you ever gone into a, you know, an unorganized iTunes library, it's a bunch of track one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. It's, it's frustrating, it's a headache. And it's, there are these third party applications that you can download that attempt to go in there and replace the metadata in a proper way, but it's still a freaking mess. Um, I'm not saying that his is the best solution, but it's a possible solution to help to mitigate the problems with such like that data. So I guess that would assume that every piece of music in a record has been registered. Because otherwise, how would you know that it doesn't already exist? Well, that's the line in the sand I keep referring to. It's going back and retroactively uh, creating all the metadata or inputting all of that metadata would just be incredibly tedious um, and perhaps not something really worth doing. Where some people will say, let's just leave that be. Others are advocating for fixing that, to have some sort of central music database, which I believe was, was mentioned earlier, um, that project to create like a central database of all music, and it, it failed. Um, this would be moving forward. So if I were to create a new record um, outside the contract of my label, I could then employ something like this. I could register my music with Jack. I could register my music with Dot Blockchain. I could register my music with Mujo. And any, any work that I've done as an artist, um, that let's say that, for example, someone wants to use one of my songs in a TV show, um, they would contact me or my management who would then put them in touch with that repository and say, here's a link, here's where you can download the terms of the agreement or see the terms of the agreement. Um, and this is what that, that contract looks like. Yeah, so the solutions that we are posing here, 